It's my uh, great pleasure to welcome one of the giants in robotics today. Uh, in, in it's up on the stage. Yeah. Coming up from, uh, well, I thought I was inviting him from Georgia Tech. Uh, <laughs> if you saw his bio, he, uh, uh, he's suddenly taking a stint uh, as chief scientist at Skydio, who many of you know as the startup that Adam Free and Abe Backrack have started and raised a bunch of VC money and everything like that. I don't know if you'll say anything about it, but many of you know Frank from his uh, you know, hugely important background in SLAM and structured from motion and you know, Graph SLAM has been, has been a great uh, open source effort in the community and I, we're gonna, I'm very happy to hear what he has to say. Thanks, Frank. Absolutely. So, so yeah, so, so, so I'm at Georgia Tech. Um, but, but I am now at Skydio, which is a, a little startup with um, a bunch of MIT grads, actually, who are awesome, okay? And uh, they called me up and they, and they said, we want to completely switch to GTSM, which is the toolbox that I've created with my students over the last couple of years, uh, and do you want to be part of that? And, uh, and I said, yeah, you know, I was in, in the middle of a sabbatical, um, and uh, so the rest of my sabbatical, I will be spending with them uh, making GTSM sort of work in the real world. Um, and so the idea is to sort of endow quadrotors with, um, with 3D awareness so that when you give a GPS waypoint, it won't crash into the nearest tree, right? Um, and do that in real time and, and at a consumer level. So, and we're looking for excellent vision engineers. If you're close to graduation, you're looking for a job in Silicon Valley, um, that's, you know, just talk to me, send me email, okay? Um, this is on the on the web, so you, so you can you can, uh, you can watch it. That's uh, Adam running. Those are the three founders. I'm employee number one. <laughs> so we're all already up to eight, and we're we're, we're stealing people left and right from Google X and, and which where these guys were. So 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 that's that. I, when I'm not at Skydio, I'm, I'm at Georgia Tech. I'm a professor there. I, I head the, the PhD program. Uh, master students among you. Application deadline is in December. We want you. It's a great program um, with, with, uh, with, with, with some great uh, faculty across uh, six different departments. Uh, so, so, uh, so please consider Georgia Tech if you're looking for grad schools to, to continue your PhD. Um, I'll be talking about stuff that I did over the couple of over the last, I guess, uh, you know, 15 years. Um, when I was at, at Carnegie Mellon, I did this, which is Monte Carlo localization, which is a sampling-based localization method, um, which is now sort of a standard thing in, in, in Robotics 101. It was just me stealing some stuff from, from, from Oxford and applying it to robotics. And it was not my PhD thesis, it was just procrastination. Um, and it's really simple to implement, and so, so here is a, uh, a, you know, something for grad students to consider uh, something that's really simple to implement might have much, much more impact than sort of the latest, greatest mathematical type thing like that, you know. Um, and so, so this surprised me as being so impactful. But this is just localization. And so, so, so clearly, you know, you have, you have a map, you have some sensor readings, you want to localize. It's sort of a simpler problem than what we now routinely tackle, which is, which is mapping. So the next student of, of, of Sebastian's um, was Michael Merlo. And he's now, um, you know, he's one of the forces behind the Google autonomous driving uh, efforts. And he applied particle filters to, to mapping and localization at the same time. Something that's, that's known in the uh, robotics uh, world as SLAM, so I'm saying is localization and mapping. Um, and, and you can have your doubts about whether a particle filter is the appropriate sort of scheme to do SLAM. I definitely have my doubts about it, but, but so you, you can see that this was sort of state of the art in, in 2002, um, 2D laser based, and, and the trajectories now the trajectories are sampled over, and the map is is really akin to the weight of each particle, right? And so this was fast and uh, was, was was quite uh, influential uh, at the time. Uh, but we, we moved away from that uh, from 2D laser. So here's some work by by Ryan Eustace, uh, which you all know. He he, uh, he graduated from MIT. Uh, this is the University of, of Michigan campus. Um, and now we're talking about sort of 2D lasers. So 2D scanning lasers put it together in a 3D point cloud, millions to billions of points. Um, and this, you know, Amon Shashua will tell you 
told you yesterday that this is not the future. I completely think this is the future, uh, that we will be mapping the hell out of the world, um, and, and, and we will have you know, cars driving on tracks, virtual tracks, but mapping is the future. And Armand wants to sell his camera, so he doesn't want you to think that, but, but that's what I think. Um, so, 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 so this is really cool. Uh, you need a $60,000 laser uh, rangefinder, so, so, um, but to get billions of points, you don't need a $70,000 laser scanner. You, you can just use a camera or a bunch of cameras or one camera across time um, or you know, a bunch of snapshots from tourists. So in the last 10 years, uh, a lot of uh, effort went into community-based databases, mining them for the images of, of, of well-known cities, artifacts. So for example, if you do a Google search on Dubrovnik, this is Noah Snavely's and Samir Agarwal's work um, at, at UW, you get a bunch of images. Some of them are actually not you know, images. So here's a map. So you have to robustly know what is what. And so there's a huge correspondence problem to be solved there. But people have solved it. Um, and, um, and then you can build 3D models from those images without a laser uh, range finder. Now you have these uh, vast point clouds. And you also know, incidentally, where each camera was at the time that that image was grabbed, which is, which is sort of also fantastic. So, so this is structure from motion, community-based structure from motion. Um, so this is um, you know, three and a half million points, 5,000 images. Um, and, and, and so this is an alternative source of, of 3D knowledge about the world. You said the, the, the just the picture, the, the work in the That's right, just the picture. And then they're all different cameras as well. So each camera might have a different focal length. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome, right? Indeed. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, you know, but now, you know, Google and Microsoft, and, and they know very well how to do that. And that's how they build. Uh, that's partly how they build their detailed 3D models behind behind uh, their search engines and, and etc. <coughs> um, so when I came to tech, um, I, I also worked on, on structure for motion with, with a, a student, Grant Schindler, uh, but we added time to it. So so this is what I call 4D reconstruction because it's 3D plus time, right? So so. Uh, our initial attempt was in Atlanta and, and was sort of polygonal model based. Um, but the key concept here was that we now have a little time slider and we can move this time slider back and forth from sort of 1864 when Sherman came to Atlanta and burned it to the ground. So there was nothing there. And so we can, we can actually slide this, this, this time slider and see Atlanta rise you know, from, from, from the ground up. And this is also completely image based, right? So, but now the images are historical. Um, but as we were doing this, you know, Samir and, 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 and Nova were sort of taking these well-established structure promotion techniques. Um, and so I told Grant, look, nobody cares about Atlanta. If you want your PhD, you also, by the way, procrastinated and made an app, uh, Trimensional. You, you should check it out. It's a structure, it's a structure from light uh, app. Um, I said, look, you know, before you graduate, you have to do Manhattan, and it has to be completely automatic. No more clicking in images, etc. So, so, so he did. He did look. You know, he uh, he did a thesis for the, the final sort of flagship uh, results uh, was, you know, doing Manhattan temporarily. Um, and, and, and so, when you do it automatically, you have to you have to do a lot more complicated stuff. But, but you know, I urge you to read the. Uh, um, the CPPR paper, and we also have sort of the time slider uh, on, on Lower Manhattan. Unfortunately, one of the biggest problems for Grant was actually getting uh, free imagery <laughs> from uh, from behind all these paywalls, you know, because everybody wants to sell their historical photographs of, of Manhattan. So, so we have a bunch from the 1930s and a bunch from sort of more modern, but sort of the 50s to the 70s is, is very good, you know, 30s, poor, very sparse. Um, so, so, so SLAM and Structure for Motion uh, have this thing in common, which is a large optimization problem in the middle, which is where are the points, where are the cameras, where was the sensor? So take all this information and, and sort of optimize the hell out of it to get a consistent 3D model um, over space and time. Um, and so my, my talk will be mostly about what I found out 
uh, over the last sort of 10 years about the structure of this problem. Um, I eventually found out about factor graphs after a lot of pain. Uh, so I'm going to spare you the pain. I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, so, so now you, you know that the correct you know, formalism to think about is, is factor graphs. And by the way, I think this also applies to optimal control. So um, I will talk about factor graphs, so the relationship in linear algebra. I will talk a little bit about the stuff that we did over the last 10 years that's sort of inspired by this uh, insight. And then I hope to have time to talk about pseudo-spectral SLAM, uh, which is something that I did in the first half of my sabbatical, which I'm really excited about. Uh, our assessor reviewers were not that excited about it, but I think it's a tragic mistake. <laughs> tragic mistake. Um, so I'll tell you about it anyway. You know. uh, so have uh, factor graphs. So, so we'll start with factor graphs. And, uh, and, and I apologize to computer scientists in the audience, but can you think of the most boring problem in computer science? It's Boolean satisfiability. OK, you have a fo Boolean formula. You want to sort of assign you know, some, some variables, uh, some, some values to these variables, and, and you want to make this formula come true. So on the face of it, it sounds boring. But I actually think it's a fascinating problem uh, once you phrase it as a factor graph. So, so now this formula comes to life, right? So we have a bunch of variables. And each of these um, factors in this formula is, is, is a factor in this graph. So, so, so in Boolean satisfiability, you have variables, you have factors which correspond to Boolean formulas, and you want to assign Boolean values to these variables that make the ending of all these formulas come through. So, so this is a factor graph, and it shows graphically what Boolean satisfiability is all about. So if you relax Booleanness and you go to multi-level uh, variables, in fact, you have what is called the constraint satisfaction problem. So a very simple problem, <coughs> um, or a very canonical problem in constraint satisfaction is the graph coloring problem, where you say you want to you know, assign a color to each of the provinces in Canada. Um, and, and so here, Quebec will, will take on a color, but you don't want it to be the same color as Ontario. Hence, this is a constraint that these should be different. right? And OK, so that's constraint satisfaction. But you can also make it into a constraint optimization problem by adding a unary factor here that might be uh, real valued. Say as well, Quebec doesn't like pink. They like blue, all right? which is the color of their, their, their flag. So they want to be either blue or white. And anything else is sort of not, not preferred if you can avoid it. right? And you could add unary factors to each of these provinces. So a factor graph to show the structure of constraint satisfaction problems. Graphical models, if you're familiar with graphical models, you'll probably be familiar with, with Bayes nets. So Bayes nets um, are, are a directed graphical model where, for example, E has a probability distribution based on its parents, T and L. This is sort of the Asia toy network that, that, that comes in every machine learning class. Can be converted to a factor graph. Um, so, so, but now the probability distribution uh, is a factor, and it's a factor on these three variables because this probability distribution really involves these three variables. Okay, so now we actually put the thing about the factor graph is rather than the base network, you take the probability densities out of the variables and you put them in these special nodes, this which are called the factors. So now, by the way, variables are still multi-value, discrete, but the factors became, you know, continuous, and and in, in, in fact. The constraint optimization problem and uh, the maximum, you know, probability assignment problem in Bayes networks is exactly the same problem. Okay, so so and and, and this this shows sort of this commonality, and that's well known, by the way. I mean, the the, the goddess of constraint satisfaction, okay, is is, is, is Rena Vector at, at UC Irvine. She wrote the book on constraint satisfaction, and she worked with Judea Pearl on on Bayes networks. So that was her her life before constraint satisfaction. So, so she knows this stuff, and she knows approximate inference in these things really well. She's totally undervalued as, as uh, in our community, I think. You know, the stuff that she has to write about is, is very cool. Something else that you might not think about here is, is uh, if you have in, in computer vision these, these, uh, these uh, minimal problems, like you have a multi-camera system and you have some observations, and you want to know where the multi-camera system is, you can actually phrase that as, as a, a system of polynomial equations involving some variables. Um, so, 
A polynomial equation, in fact, uh, can, be, can be phrased as a factor graph. So there's some variables, and each of these factors now is a polynomial equation that you want to make true or false. So now, so now this, this becomes a sort of a roots finding problem. It can be phrased as a factor graph. And then finally, SLAM. So, so probably the last time I gave this, this talk, I, I didn't have all these previous slides. I just had this slide, which was SLAM. You have a robot that goes around. So there's a trajectory of the robot, which is the, the pose at time 0, the pose at time m, all poses in between. Uh, there is a Markov chain that says this is the motion model of the robot. It might see some landmarks. Uh, so there is constraints, probabilistic constraints that link poses to landmarks. And this is a factor graph corresponding to SLAM. So now everything is continuous. Um, uh, the landmarks are continuous. The poses are continuous. These, these things are continuous probability density. So this is the fully continuous. System. So we went from good insatisfiability, right? Everything is discrete and hard to everything is continuous. And, the, and what I haven't shown, but there's some really interesting work I was at Oxford last week on a thesis by Alex Segal, uh, who did hybrid inference. So now you can actually make some of these variables discrete and do fully hybrid inference. Um, and, and so that, I think, is a, is a very interesting sort of point here. Um, all right, by the way, here is, here is a, a, a simple example. I've shown this before, I think here even. Uh, so here's a little robot, see a bunch of stuff, and the factor graph associated with this shows you very graphically the structure of this problem. And so one thing that you find is that it's not fully connected, it's sort of a sparse problem. A fully connected graph, you wouldn't see anything on this on this view graph, right? So 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 the question becomes how can we exploit that sparsity to solve these problems? And and this is the same question for all these different diverse problems. For building satisfiability up to this. Yeah. And this high level view, is there an easy way to see where inequality constraint would fit in? Uh, where an inequality constraint would fit in. Um, yeah, you could put a factor somewhere and, and make it infinite cost if it violates the, uh, the inequality constraint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, we built that into GTSM recently. So, we, we, you know, we're also interested in the, in the in sort of snobbed area. Um, although it's very, very difficult. <laughs> so so I, I call this, you know, smoothing and mapping uh, rather than SLAM. SLAM sort of is a bit more interested in sort of the final value uh, only and are we interested in the entire trajectory. Yes? I assume these are associations to be for the problem. Are you going to discuss how you establish those associations? Nope. <laughs> I'm just going to say, look, some, some smart kid has done that for me. All right? Uh, but Alexander Segal's thesis, interestingly, you could simply add that as a variable, a discrete variable in the whole thing, and optimize for it, except it will be completely intractable. Yeah. So, so, so we, uh, here's a, a totally different approach to this question is, by the way, make all of these factors robust. And then you just don't worry about wrong correspondences. You just have some, some computer data to make everything robust and hope that the optimizer will sort of get you the right. And that, that's been a trend in, in, in SLAM as well. These are great questions. Keep them coming. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is multivariate. Factors are nonlinear. We, we typically do and turn this into a nonlinear least squares problem you know, by assuming Gaussian noise or, or, or reiterated Gaussian noise in case of uh, robust uh, methods. Uh, this is an example from Search of Emotion. So really, the factor graph is like the visibility graph. Right, so 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 here is a bunch of cameras. This is a, a data set taken by by by, by Grant uh, back in the day, and so you see each of these lines is sort of connects a point with a camera and is a, is a factor. Okay, all right, good. So that, so that's a sort of overview of factor graphs, <coughs> and at least this 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 thing is clear. Factor graphs are really the way to think about these things. Okay, it's it's the best graphical model, really. Base networks can be converted to factor graphs. Markov fields better represented as factor graphs. Uh, Kevin Murphy has a MATLAB-based toolbox for base network inference. First thing he does, convert it to a factor graph. Okay. It, it's really the, the language you think in. What does this have to do with optimization? How do you optimize those things? Uh, I'm going to speak about a very specific instance where you assume Gaussian noise and linear models, in which case you can use, if you must, linear algebra. Okay, 
But I will, I will basically say that you know, linear algebra is a very special case of inference in factor graphs. Um, and, and, um, and so you should be thinking about graphs rather than matrices. Okay. All right. I think the last time I was here, I, I said you have to take your head out of the matrix gutter and then think about graphs. Right. And that's what people do. The people that build these sparse algorithms under MATLAB, people like Tim Davis, they are thinking about graphs and nothing else. The sparse matrix of you know, the solving is, is a graph-based problem. So, and, and uh, Michael Case probably already told you about this. Anyway. So, so if you have a nonlinear D squares problem, you have a factor graph. You can also see that um, the factor graph actually corresponds immediately to a matrix, which is a, a block sparse matrix, where each column corresponds to a variable and each row corresponds to a factor. Okay, and so if a factor, say, T0 and P1 are, you know, are connected, it means that there would be two non-zero blocks in this matrix. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping from these linear algebra problems, sparse linear algebra problems, to the factor graphs. And you repeatedly linearize, so it's only when you linearize that you get this. In fact, the factor graph is more general. This is a nonlinear uh, problem. If you linearize, you get a, 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 a linear problem that you want to solve. Okay, so, so here's actually the matrix of that small problem that, that, that I showed uh, earlier. Uh, so, so here again, this is the factor graph and the matrix, and there's a one-to-one -one mapping, a bunch of variables which correspond to the, uh, the, the variables in the graph, and a bunch of factors or rows. Each, each factor here corresponds to a row. Okay. So how do you solve non-linear least square systems? Well, you form the system of normal equations. This is sort of linear algebra 101, I guess. Um, and uh, well, the only thing you have to do is invert this matrix A transpose A, which is a Hessian of your system. Uh, except if you do that, you're crazy, okay? Because, because it's, it's very expensive to do so. Uh, so what you do instead is you factorize it. So you take this A transpose A and you factor it into uh, an upper triangular matrix R transpose R. Uh, and there's two ways to do that. You can go straight, um, actually, from, uh, from A with QR factorization to R. Or you can go, to, you know, you go build A transpose A and do Cholesky, right? This route is a little bit less numerically stable because A transpose A is really taking squares of a bunch of numbers. So if this thing is ill-conditioned, this is ill-conditioned squared, right? So, 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 but it's, it's faster. This route is faster. All right, so uh, if you do that, for example, with sort of a, I, I just put a random data set here. Uh, this is the corridor you just walk through uh, to get here. This is the Academy Core data set uh, due, due to John. John disappeared. Yeah. Oh, oh, there you are. Okay. You, you moved. Okay. <laughs> so so um, uh, the, the upper triangular matrix corresponding to the solution of this problem uh, is, this, is this thing. <laughs> it's sparse. That's, that's about the only thing you can say about it is that it's sparse. All right, no insight into the problem whatsoever. Okay, um, so so my, my my goal ten years ago was, what the heck is QR, and, and why why is it so slow, uh, and and, um, and and then I found out about factor graphs and everything they do. Yeah, so it was really just that. So before I tell you about what QR does underneath, uh, I have to sort of make a, a detour. Um, you, you can you can you can not see it very well, but this, this is Vesta. It's a little uh, planetoid uh, that's between here uh, it's, and, and, and uh, it's between here and Ceres, I should say. So Ceres, have you heard of Ceres? Or everybody has. So in some audience I have to explain here, I don't, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. Ceres is this planetoid which when it was discovered, it was Eureka, there is another planet. It was the hottest thing in scientific discovery. Uh, back in the day, uh, and everybody wanted to figure out, you know, what Ceres was and where it was and what, what its orbit was. And, and unfortunately, you only had like three or four sightings of Ceres before it disappeared behind the sun, so you couldn't see it anymore. And the race was on, sort of, you know, who could predict where Ceres would appear uh, from behind the sun. Uh, and so that's, that's actually what got Gauss his tenure track position. All right, because, because he does figured out, rediscovered, because it was sort of discovered by the Chinese, you know, 2,000 years ago, like everything else, 
Um, Gauss reinvented Gauss nomination um, to determine the orbit of Ceres and then was able to predict, you know, sort of only a couple of degrees off where Ceres appeared and it was, it appeared there and that sort of made his, his, uh, his, his career. Um, and so, so, so it's, it's a very cool algorithm and it will solve all of these problems. Okay, it solves Boolean satisfiability, the first Boolean satisfiability problem solution ever um, is, is Davis Putnam and, and that's just cross nomination. And it will also solve you know, this linear system and it will solve SLAM, okay? Um, Don, which is a spacecraft that took these images of, 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 uh, of Vesta and will also, um, um, it's almost at, at Ceres now, so it's a very exciting time. Um, is also the sort of the only spacecraft in the solar system that is powered by an ion motor. So, so that's, that's kind of cool in science fiction. So what is variable elimination? Well, you take your factor graph um, and you eliminate one node at a time. So, so for example, you eliminate L1 first. You say, look, all the variables connected to L1, this is X1 and X2. You take the joint probability distribution induced by the factors that they are connected to and you factorize that local distribution into a conditional and a joint on the separator. And that's the key operation in Gaussian elimination. And for every different problem that I sort of put out there, this operation means something different. In Boolean satisfiability, it is something different than in, you know, in, um, in SLAM, but really they could all be described as a factorizing of a joint density. It's only that in Boolean satisfiability, this, this is a discrete density, which, and, and there are discrete variables. Um, and when you do that, what you do is you take L1 now becomes a function of its separator, and you have a smaller factor graph left, and you recurse until you transform the entire uh, factor graph into a base net. And once you have that, that base net, whoops, sorry, once you have that base net, in fact, you can simply read up the solution, because now X3 has a unique solution uh, given that L2 has a solution, given that X2 has a solution, then X2 you know, gives you X1, and then X2 and X1 set together to do L1. And that's the back substitution in linear algebra. Okay? Oh, and by the way, as an aside, yes, this, this, you know, this, 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 this matrix became upper triangular, but it's almost besides the point. Right? So, so the, the, the real algorithm is this graphical elimination algorithm. Uh, it also works for polynomial equations, by the way. So this, this polynomial equation stuff uh, is, you know, you take your original factor graph, uh, you, then you express one of the variables as, as, as a function of the other two, but now your degree polynomial here, you, you actually get a degree four polynomial, and then you eliminate the, uh, lambda two, and you get a degree eight polynomial, and you solve this, you know, univariate polynomial, and you back substitute, and you get the solutions to the entire polynomial. Which is, which is really cool, because this is, I think, you know, I don't know enough about it, but I think this is exactly what Brevner bases in polynomial solving do. So, so, so even Brevner bases are sort of inherently an elimination here. All right, so, so, so the two things I established, I think, um, and I'll entertain questions here, is that factor graphs are really cool. They describe every problem under the sun, I'm gonna pretend. And the, the way, one algorithm that rules them all is the elimination algorithm. And you can solve any factor graph with this elimination uh, algorithm. So, any questions about that? Yes, so, so, so far you assume that uh, solving means finding the maximum likelihood of solution. No, I, I haven't really assumed that. Um, because because that, that base net, right, the, 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 the final sort of posterior X3 is a full density. And so you can sort of back substitute back and get marginals on, on everything else. So, so it's, it's not just the maximum. Uh, so, there is, so you can also do, do marginals. Yeah. So Gaussian elimination can be unstable in some cases. And reordering is important for stability. That's going to be the next slide. OK. Yeah. <laughs> but not for stability, actually. But, but uh, for computational efficiencies, reordering is very important. For, for stability, uh, Probably, yeah. Uh, I don't know the answer to that very well. But we, we can talk about it offline. Uh, you had a question as well? No? Yeah. Anyone else?
Okay. All right, so the next slide is, is the ordering one. <laughs> Sorry. So it's an elimination game, and so the elimination ordering, the, the way you order your variables, the, the way in which you eliminate those variables, the order in which is very important. Some orders lead to very fast computation and very sparse uh, uh, square root factors. And other orderings lead to completely connected graphs. And guess what? The best ordering is empty complete. So, so the, the best you can do is, is, is sort of, unless you have a lot of domain knowledge, is, is do a heuristic. But luckily there are some very good heuristics out there. Um, and, and, and one of them, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go on. So, so Kai, uh, Kai Nee is a student that worked with me and did a PhD um, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, one of the ways you can find a good ordering is to take your entire graph and split it up into pieces. Uh, and so you can solve uh, things out of four. So that was his first paper, but his other paper is, so here's a large chunk of motion data set. You can recursively subdivide this large graph into smaller and smaller graphs. And then the ordering is a pulse ordering sort of that you go from the leaves back to, to, to the top. Uh, and that ordering is sort of provably the best ordering you can get. So in fact, somebody at, at Georgia Tech uh, now at Georgia Tech that he was at Princeton is Dick Lipton, who sort of proved a bunch of theorems uh, that made finite elements uh, sort of theoretically grounded. And, and, and a lot of it is, 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 is uh, nested dissection, about nested dissection, um, and, and, and sort of that the best ways to divide up very large graph problems is by recursively cutting uh, and finding separators. Which is still, it's still uh, hard to find the separators though, right? So, so you don't get it, but we like. Is it the image up at the top the solution to a problem? Yes, yes. Here it is. So, 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 but, but we don't know where the points are. We don't know where the cameras are. So this this is a nice visualization that shows it as the solution. Uh, but in the beginning, you get this big, humongous graph, and you have to try and find a separator in that graph that sort of cleanly separates it into two about even pieces. Okay. Yeah. And you try to do that, and then you take that even piece, and you try to do it again, and again, and again, until you have such a small problem that you don't have to worry about the order. And you solve it, and then you try to put the, the things back together. Mm -hmm. right. and, and that's, uh, so, so Kai wrote several papers on that, and, and the last one was Hyper SFM, uh, because it uses uh, a library um, to, to, you know, to, to subdivide in, in hypergraphs. Um, Michael, Case uh, was a student of mine who, who uh, did his things here at uh, MIT, uh, did amazing work with, with John Leonard. Um, uh, he and I came, came up with, well, really, we stole from the linear algebra book, uh, Grollip and Van Loon. Uh, interesting anecdote, I, uh, I was skiing for two days this year, I skied. Uh, it was fantastic. It was with Mark Kolfes' group in, in, in Switzerland, and they do a group retreat they go ski because they're in Switzerland. Right. So I joined them, and um, and I had, I think, Van Loon's shoes. I had, somehow he had Van Loon's shoes. I don't know how, but, uh, but I used the, his shoes. So I, I was, I stepped in the shoes of uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, So So in Go from Van Loon, there is factorization, Cholesky, QR, you know, and it's dense, but there's also incremental factorization algorithms. And, and, and some of them are based on, on, um, on, on Gibbons rotations. And so our, our first, uh, so, so we thought, well, can we do this factorization incrementally? What if you have a robot and you get more and more measurements? Um, can you, do you have to do this factorization over and over again? No, the answer is, it's very clear. You know, you can just take this new information and update your factorization, okay? With these methods from, from, from dense linear algebra. Um, but then I, I wasn't really, um, so, so, so this is, is Michael, he's now at, at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so here is uh, this, this square root factor R, and if you add a little bit of new information, you, have to, you don't have to do the whole thing again, you only have to touch this red part. But I, I, I wasn't satisfied with using matrix methods. I, I wanted to understand what it was, what we're doing graphically, okay? And that led to sort of, I guess maybe a rediscovery or something, but, but the fact that really when you're factorizing, that base network that you get 
has a structure and it has a clique structure and a clique structure is you know a clique tree a junction tree uh, if you di you know I, I call it a base tree when it's a directed uh, junction tree and so we, we started looking at incremental factorization as editing a directed junction tree um, and, and that's the ISAM2 work and I think this this is still you know one the, the work that I'm most proud of over, the, over these 15 years is, is, is this stuff is really state-of-the-art really works is really the way to do incremental search for motion navigation everything if you're doing any type of other stuff you should really be looking at, at, at ISM2 and at the paper and try to understand what the heck it's doing. Um, so so uh, this was immensely successful. Um, here at MIT, Michael and, and John and, and his students did really cool stuff with putting it together with sort of Kinect measurements. Uh, so uh, you all seen this stuff multiple times and we're gonna show everything. Um, so um, at, at, you know, in collaboration, John and Ryan Eustace uh, sort of mapped, you know, aircraft carriers, you know, based on, 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 on Michael's uh, implementation of ISAM. Um, so, so this has been very impactful. Uh, and it's very gratifying to see that Michael and John were so successful in sort of taking it out in the real world, which is definitely not my forte, okay? So, um, all right, so another um, interesting uh, thing that, that you find out when you have graphs is that sometimes the graphs are just too connected. To, to run the elimination algorithm, okay? Uh, when you run the elimination algorithm, you, you run into a clique, that clique is massive, and you end up grinding to a halt trying to factorize that clique. And so some graphs, you just can't get away from it. Um, so we've been also been looking at iterative conjugate gradient-like methods, um, where you take an entire graph that might be too hard for the elimination problem, uh, but you find an easy, <coughs> an easy subgraph in it. For example, a spanning tree. A spanning tree is, is a graph that has a linear solution. It corresponds to it, a block diagonal matrix, really. Um, and you solve that with the elimination algorithm, with a direct method. Um, and then you use that as a preconditioner to solve for the hard part, which are the loop closures, all the things that make the graph not a tree. Okay. So, so that's something that, again, we came up with and then discovered that there is a whole literature that developed over the last 10 years in theory, uh, which is support graph theory, that, that is now coming up with sort of linear methods for solving uh, large complex linear systems by, by finding good subgraphs. So, so, so really graphs, when looking at graphs, gives you insight that leads to very interesting computational ideas. Um, and, 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 um, and so I can't stress that enough that you, can't look at these things as matrices to solve. Um, here's a, 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 an illustration of this. So, so one of my students, Young Dian, who now works for Kai, actually, so they're both at Baidu Research, um, who, who are currently funding a bunch of 3D work. Um, uh, he, he applied this to structure for motion. So here's the same uh, uh, Chicago data set. If you find a subgraph in here, like a spanning tree, or maybe a sparsely connected subgraph, almost a spanning tree, and you solve it, you get something that looks like the final solution, but it's sort of fuzzy and not very well determined because you, you're not using all the constraints. Um, so it's not exactly there, but it found most of the structure of the problem. Uh, and then if you use this as a preconditioner, and the preconditioner is really just a reparameterization of the problem such that you have a better condition number, um, you, you can quickly find, find the final solution. Right? And Luca Carlone, uh, who's my postdoc, was here last, um, last week, and, and he did some work with, with Dave Rosen about, okay, so, so sometimes, um, you know, when you, when you find that global minimum, you might not know that you're in the global minimum uh, so, so, so Dave and, and John and Luca have, have come up with sort of duality methods to prove that they're not the global minimum. So, so there's a, um, as, as John said, uh, if you're going to fly quad rotors and airplanes and things autonomously uh, based on techniques that sort of map the world, we might want to know for sure that the answer is correct, right? Uh, to, 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 uh, so, so one of MIT's um, people that is now also at Georgia Tech is Eric Foron. Eric Foron uh, did a lot of acrobatics with, with planes and stuff. And he's also 
very interesting, very verifiable systems of verification of all these algorithms. Um, and I think that will be very, very important. Uh, here's another example of the Notre Dame. This is the solution of subgraph. This is the final solution. And then finally, you can also think about taking these graphs that you could build on a single robot. But what if you have multiple robots going around in the world? And do you need to you know, send all the measurements to a central server? You know, crank through the solution and send the solution back to, to different robots? Or could you solve these graphs or in a distributed manner across the platforms? And that's work that was done by Alex Cunningham, who's now with Ryan Eustis and Ed Olson um, at, at Michigan, uh, working on their autonomous uh, uh, vehicle project. Um, and uh, another student of mine, Jing, um, sort of carried on this work and worked with uh, Carnegie Mellon. I want to show you this video, which I just showed at a mass, ERL mass review, uh, which is really fabulous. Okay, so I'm just going to play the, the video. This is work with, with Nathan Michael, uh, who was at UPenn, did all the quadrilateral stuff at UPenn. He built um, uh, some quadrilaters at CMU. And what, you, what you'll see here, if it works, is uh, two robots taking off at different parts of the environment. They don't know where they are with respect to one another. Uh, they start mapping the world. You know, in the, in the individually, and then try to figure out their their uh, their relative transform, and then and then sort of create a map collaboratively of the entire environment. All right. So here is the uh, the quadrotor that that Nate built with his team. Uh, and we go somewhere else, and we see a second quadrotor. Uh, it will take off. Uh, so they both take off. This is also work with Vadim Indelman, who's now at Technio. This is ICRA 2015, right? This is ICRA 2015, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so each robot builds its own map. This is a still sort of 2D laser base here. Uh, the next step is to do this with molecular vision. Um, right, and they are blissfully unaware of each other, but they're constantly sending each other sort of information about what they're seeing. Uh, and at one point, they will realize that, they're in the, that they've been in the same spot. They don't have to be there at the same time. Uh, they just have to uh, realize that they've seen part of the environment that's in common. Okay, so and here it doesn't look like it, but this is actually uh, the same, right? And then they have a, 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 a common coordinate frame. They can put together their maps, uh, and and uh, and you can scale this up to more than two robots. So this is a fully n robot um, uh, solution, and we've done it with. We've done it with three, so then it works for M, right? <laughs> <laughs> but in real time, okay, this is all in real time, real time mapping, real time correspondence, uh, and, 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 and you get a map in real time. Of course, the army is really interested in this because they want to send multiple of these flying things in an unknown area and, uh, and get a map. Um, so, so, so this is indeed work that will now appear in the So. Um, awesome, good, wow, I think I, I'm on time. Um, because I want to talk about this pseudo-spectral slam that RSS didn't like. But there's no, there's no, you know, I got bad reviews, but there's no decisions yet, but I don't think we will get in. Hmm? Wait till next week. Wait till next week. <laughs> but, uh, but this, in my, in my, the first half of my sabbatical, so it, uh, I, 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 I got to play with Paul for Gale. Paul for Gale is, uh, a graduate from Toronto, worked with Tim Barfoot, and Tim and, and Paul sort of created this sort of new idea in SLAM, which is called Continuous Time SLAM, um, which is the idea that when you're flying a quadrotor uh, and you're getting IMU measurements at a, fra at a rate of 200 hertz, or maybe me you know, images at a rate of 30 hertz, you could introduce an unknown pose Right? Where was the robot at the time that this image was, was taken? Um, but still, the trajectory is quite smooth. And, 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 um, and so it, it seems like a waste of money and time and computation to, to drop 10,000 poses and try to optimize for 10,000 poses, where maybe the entire trajectory is a very low dimensional thing, which can be described very nicely by some basis be it a spline basis or a polynomial basis. So, so that's the, the, the basic idea that Paul and, and Tim sort of introduced in the SLAM community a couple of years back. 
Um, and I also got interested in uh, Chebyshev polynomials. So, so you know, when, when in Lerva, I started, you know, playing with Chebyshev polynomials. And so Chebyshev polynomials sounds impressive, I, you know, but it's really, really simple, you know. It's almost sort of um, childishly simple, right? So everybody knows that you can build uh, an approximation of any function on a circle by, you know, a Fourier basis, by just summing up a bunch of sines and cosines. Right? And that's the Fourier uh, decomposition. Well, it doesn't work if your function is non periodic, uh, right? So, so what did you know, Chebyshev do is he takes all the cosines and just says, well, let's just collapse it onto the midline of the circle. Now we have these collapsed cosine waves from that, that are valid from minus 1 to 1. Um, and you see that it sort of it, 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 it varies a little bit faster at the edges of the, of the interval. <coughs> and lo and behold, if you do that, you take those sine waves and you collapse them to the midline, they turn out to be polynomials. So, so the first one is just a constant, the, 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 the zero one. The first one is a line, the second one is a quadratic, the third one is a, is a cubic. Uh, it's pretty remarkable in, in a way that, that they're, they're polyn polynomials. And that is sort of the native spectral basis of the interval. And intervals are important for robotics because we're all about trajectories through time. So we have a T0 and a Tn, and we want to run you know, an estimated trajectory or plan a trajectory. Um, and so, so you could argue that Chebyshev polynomials are the basis to the spectral basis in which to do this work, um, uh, even though people have not done it in, in SLAM yet. Okay, so that's, that's the Chebyshev basis. <coughs> and so, so here's a here's here's an example. So here's the first one, and the second one is a quadratic, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And there's there's a second idea, which is you can use it in a sort of Fourier way, which is a set of basis functions with weights and just sum them. But there is a, a, there is there is a different way of parameterizing them, which turns out to be equivalent, which is you just give the function value at a set of special points, which are called Chebyshev points or the gauss lobato something or other points, but um, my hero at Oxford, you know, Nick Trefetten, who was at MIT here at one point, actually, uh, because he is the first paying customer of MATLAB. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think in a couple of weeks, his 60th birthday event will happen at, um, at Oxford, and one of the, the speakers is, is, is Gilbert Strang. So, 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 you know, he's, I, I got to meet him last week, uh, and I sort of in awe of meeting him. Um, and and the, um, there is a reason why you choose those points and not a, a uh, uniform uh, interval. And the reason is uh, numerical condition. With a uniform splitting of interval, nothing will work. And with these championship points, everything will work out. And, but it's not hard to make those Chebyshev points. You just take a uniform grid on the circle and you project to the midline and you have your Chebyshev points. Isn't that amazing? I thought, uh, I'm sorry, I'm geeky and, and yeah, I think this is cool. <coughs> so that's pseudospectral. And there is a whole field called pseudospectral optimal control whose who is sort of success story is that they, they, uh, they did a direct collocation method, which I didn't know what it was until I I took uh, Russ's online course. Okay, <laughs> direct collocation, if I'm correct, is um, you you optimize for both the state and the control, and you somehow enforce the dynamics. And so, pseudo spectral optimal control just parameterizes both state and control as Chebyshev polynomials, say, and enforces the dynamics at the Chebyshev point. And now you turn optimal control. Uh, into uh, just a polynomial optimization problem, okay? And um, they, there is a, a famous paper in, in pseudospectral open control that, that says that they saved NASA a million dollars, and, and this is how they did it. So there's a space station. Sometimes the space station has to be turned around 180 degrees. There is a simple solution. You take your eigenaxis and you rotate around the eigenaxis. Unfortunately, fuel costs Ten thousand dollars a pound to get it up there. So, so if you, if you use thrusters to do this, it costs them a million dollars. So, could we do something more interesting that maybe 
uses just reaction wheels, you know, the, and and um, and then dips into the atmosphere, and makes the atmosphere do most of the work, and then sort of you know rectifies things at the end, right? And and that's exactly what these guys did. So they 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 came up, they races as a ch you know championship polynomial basis. They might have used Legendre uh, polynomials, and they came up with a very non-obvious way <coughs> to to steer those reaction wheels and then did the whole maneuver with zero propellant, right, and saved miles on a million dollars. So, pretty cool. Um, and they sell this software, of course. Right, it's, uh, it's, not really, it's like smart. They also have this, this software that they sell, um, which is, I can't remember what it's called. It's called uh, Dido. Dido. Anyway, awesome stuff. I want to take this stuff and use it in SLAM Right, because I think that if you have a quad rotor, you maybe should use the dynamics of the quad rotor uh, when you're estimating stuff. Right? So the idea is to use these ideas from pseudo-spectral open control, well, to pseudo-spectral parameterization, um, and these, the idea of enforcing dynamic defects um, at these championship points. Okay? So if you have a very simple bicycle model, um, you can sort of phrase these dynamic defects um, in terms of your polynomial parameters, x and u, which are not just matrices of coefficients. I'm not going to bore you with the, uh, the details. Um, but it's easy to do. I coded it up um, with, with GTCM4. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Uh, you can extend it to 3D rigid body dynamics uh, by using an exponential parameterization of, of, of rotations, which, which are the, is the main pain in the butt. Right? Rotations, you know about them, panels. They're, 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 they're terrible. Um, but, so it works for 2D. Uh, so this is a simple um, uh, 2D slam problem. It was completely done. So you see that the, the solution is only sort of specified at the um, Chebyshev points. Uh, it, it works. So this is the, uh, the, the simple example. Uh, and I applied it to this example. So there's a whole new trend in quad rotors, which is first person flying. So you take, you, you, make your, you build your own quad rotor, otherwise you're sort of not hardcore. Um, <laughs> you put a camera in the front, and then uh, you have a, a video transmitter, and you put goggles on, and you fly this thing as if you're you know, looking out. Uh, and so this is all the rage. So this is by a pilot called Sharpu, who is, who is really good. Um, so if they fly this. This is not sped up. This is just flying inside a building. Right? I don't know how he does it. Uh, I think he scouts the building in advance to, to know what he can do. And he can do. But this snippet sort of applies structure from motion to it. Um, and so this is what my, my student Jing did. So here is the trajectory with this traditional structure from motion pipeline with, with, uh, with 100 poses. Or you can you know, parameterize the entire thing using this uh, pseudo-spectral basis. Um, and you get the same results. Uh, but now you can, and, and by the way, this is preliminary. I don't trust these results yet. This is very hot of the press. Um, uh, the, 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 the green here is the, um, is the, the structure from motion solution. And the red is the pseudo-spectral solution. And the, the rotation angles are spot on. So, so we, we get basically the same solution. But something that you can get from this is you can optimize for the control. So we actually, use, by enforcing these dynamic defects, really you reduce the real dimensionality of the problem to not the 12 dimensional state over time, but to the four dimensional underactuated controls, right, that Charco used to fly this thing through that building. And that's the, the power, I think, of using these ideas of pseudo-spectral open control and work in terms of, okay, what's what's the platform? What are the controls? How do the controls relate to the dynamics, the state, and then just solve for the controls? And that and that's, I think that's a really cool idea. It's it's a, it is it's a pseudo spectral open control idea that then apply to stuff. And I think that you can then also, by the way, do optimum control in the same factor graph. This is all based on factor graph, so you could do sort of slam before t and optimum control control in the future and sort of have T move with you as you go along. So we could do sort of this unified slam optimal control flying of 
Bravo is, or any other vehicle, actually. So, so that I, I'm very excited about that. So, good. Um, this is all made possible. We, we poured all our knowledge into this BSD open source toolbox called GTSEM. Um, we have a, a MATLAB, and maybe soon, uh, if somebody uh, here is, is called, a, a Python uh, interface to it. Uh, GTSEM 3.2 is the one that's now sort of available to the general public. It has multi-threading, it has smart factors, and it has LAGO, which are two things that sort of Luca brought to, to our lab. Um, but the really exciting thing, which is what I did with Paul in, in the fall, uh, is that GTSEM 4, still behind Bitbucket Vault, but any of you is welcome to join us, um, uses an expression language in which I coded this entire pseudo-spectral thing. Uh, so I, yeah, my sabbatical I was coding. Uh, and I coded this, so we have a fully automatic differentiation framework now behind GTSEM. Uh, so the only thing you have to do is create an expression for your measurement function. All the derivatives are automatic. Um, and it's faster than hand coded derivatives because it uses reverse AD, which is a well-known trick to, to speed up the calculation of derivatives. So it's, it's really fantastic. Not just because I say so, because Paul brought some of these ideas uh, in, into GDSAM, and it was just really a joy to program uh, and, and to work with. So, so something that you should be looking at if you're doing inference or even optimal control. Um, and did I mention Skydio? <laughs> We're looking for really good vision engineers. If you're close to graduation, if Silicon Valley is something that appeals to you, uh, we're just, uh, you know, after a seed, uh, VC seed round, that means that stock options are still worth potentially a whole lot. <laughs> and uh, so, so if you're looking for uh, a career in, in, uh, in industry, a startup is, in, is a viable, uh, viable thing to do. Uh, good, that's it. Can I do one more? Sure. So a lot of this band of parallels actually uh, the numeric analysis method for the algebra and things like that. So what are the benefits looking at the problem as a graph rather than as a matrix? And actually we with the numeric analysis also start to look at the response matrices as a just graph and activity graph. Yeah, no, I think because because the because as I showed you, right, if you look at a matrix, the matrix is really sort of a clumsy 2D way to write down a graph, right? It, 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 was, it was good in the 19th century, but now we, we can look at graphs and look at the structure of graphs with visualization tools and, 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 and think about graphs um, in, in, which, in ways that matrices, when you look at them, just don't inspire any knowledge. And so I, I believe that's the, the biggest win here. Um, something that the Skydio people actually told me as well is why, why are they interested in sort of working with factor graphs and GTSAM is because it, it also shows you how easily you can change this graph, add to this graph, edit this graph. You know, you, you start thinking about stuff in a completely different way. You know, it's not just filtering and smoothing and, and, and equations. It's, it's really sort of knowledge and how knowledge is inserted into your system. Um, that, that makes it um, easier to think about. And, and, and you invent new things by having easier ways to think about stuff. Did you find that they can better explain maybe some of the algebra algorithms using graphs? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So a QR is elimination. You know, an incremental QR is editing a junction tree. Uh, you know, preconditioning can be seen as, as, as solving a subgraph. So absolutely. Um, so in this pseudo-spectral study, um, it looked like you had short trajectories from now in the experiments. Can you also handle like large, long, very long trajectories with the single basis, or would you kind of put them together? <laughs> so Trafetan, so I, I visited him, and, uh, and he has this toolbox called Chepfa for Chebyshev functions. He computes with functions, and the underlying Technology is Chebyshev expansions. And he works routinely with, with thousand degree polynomials. Okay? Now, 
Whether that's suitable for, for SLAM, and especially incremental SLAM and incremental mapping, is, is open to debate, because it's a global parameterization. But it has a, it's a global parameterization with very, and I still don't understand this stuff. I've been working with it a couple of months, okay? So, so but it has great approximation properties. So with, with a few numbers, you can get very good approximations, very good interpolations. Um, so, so, and he has a paper specifically where he says, for example, yes, you could use sort of spline bases, which are sparse, right? So, so they're local and sparse, but then they run into trouble, in numerical trouble, uh, he would argue. I'm, I'm, I'm not yet convinced, I don't completely understand it yet. It will take me a few years. Can I ask, yeah. Yeah. Big picture. Seeing this great interest in robots, self-driving cars, and, drones, and and all these algorithms getting out there into the use of the real world, is exciting. Um, but I wonder, like, are there? What are your thoughts on like the role of academic researchers in terms of how do we? Uh, what are the right problems for us to work on, given like Google and all these robot companies and things, and in, and in, and in particular, how do we? Uh, what can we do to help? I don't know, John. I mean, look, I'm, I'm a geek. I work on what interests me, you know, and, and, um, and um, I don't have a good answer for that. I'm, I'm not a policy guy. <laughs> I, I, um, I took a sabbatical, maybe also because I, I was sort of burned out a little bit on, 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 uh, on, that, on the academic sort of incremental way of, of thinking. But um, sometimes it's incremental. Sometimes it becomes incremental, especially in, in, in uh, in computer vision, I don't know. Computer vision has grown tremendously. There's like now 2,000, 2,500 submissions per conference. The reviewing load is enormous. It's one incremental paper after another. There's still some good ideas that come out. But, um, and so, so I'm probably the wrong person to ask. <laughs> I, I want to sort of make this thing work in the real world for a little bit. And I hope to come back, or I will come back, that's sort of inspired and knowing more about the, the real problems that we should be answering. So, no, no, no easy answer. I'll counter that with a nerdy question. So, um, uh, you're trying to tell me that if, if I wanted to just do a QR factorization, that converting to a factor graph and using the algorithms that come out of these constraint satisfaction could compete with something like the facts, you know, factorization. I mean, is that, is that the story I'm no, no, no. Um, the, really, the factor graph story, the elimination story, is really a way to explain what those LaPap mm -hmm. algorithms are doing. And in GTSAM, I've pushed my students against repeated efforts uh, to subvert this, um, <laughs> to do the linear part completely with factor graphs as well. Uh, so, so GTSAM you build a nonlinear factor graph, which is a linearized, and then we could really give it to LAPAC, or, 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 or really, we, we want to give it to sparse suite, which is the thing that's the best performance out there. But I didn't want that, because then I was afraid that my students wouldn't get it, how it was really done. It would just, it would just again, be a black box. Uh, I think now we're up to uh, the part where, where our implementation of it, with the multi-threading, et cetera, is, is almost as good as sparse um, suite so so it sort of paid off but we could switch this at any time without any performance loss or gain I think. Um, it's a way of thinking that I want the students to have not you know, the algorithm. The other thing is we just implemented QP and LP and there is also a factor graph way of looking at those things so so uh, so my student Zui, who's now at iRobot, very close to here, um, he and I have sort of been looking and attacking QP in the same framework. And again, I think it leads to insights. So maybe we can talk about that this afternoon. <laughs>